having uh, focused on obesity for 25 years. And uh, we did that because we felt that this was a growing concern for, for many individuals, uh, obviously also for healthcare systems. And the growth of obesity is really linked to how we live today. Um, if, if one reflects on how each one of us uh, moves around in society today compared to that to our, our childhood. Uh, I remember how I got on my bike in the morning, went to school. Uh, I feel guilty about having taken my kids in the car uh, more nowadays. Uh, I was in China last week and it dawned on me how uh, that has also changed a lot compared to when I visited China for the first time some perhaps 20, 30 years back. Uh, where there were a lot of bikes uh, on the road. Uh, today, there are a lot of cars. Uh, the bikes have been replaced by electrical bikes or, or scooters. So I think those are just examples of how we live nowadays. And our bodies are designed for a much different lifestyle, uh, one of hard physical labor to make enough uh, money to, uh, to buy a meal. And our bodies are shaped to then store that energy uh, for for a long time and uh, also uh, living with hunger is a natural part of of life uh, and we look at that much different today and that leads to more and more struggling with with weight and becoming obese absolutely so Lars we we've chatted I work at breaking views which is the financial commentary arm of Reuters and we like to number crunch and to look at one of the biggest, uh, most interesting things, obviously, about Wegovy, which is the obesity drug that you sell, is, is the cost, right? So you have to factor in that a government, which is very cash strapped after the pandemic, will have to think about that cost for each individual person that they are going to treat. And so I just wondered how, when you're talking to a government or an insurance provider in the U.S., what is the calculation that you do, that you talk them through about? So if you think that obesity leads to other very costly conditions in the future or is likely to lead to, to costly conditions like cancers and cardiovascular events. So how do you talk them through the cost benefit of, of $1,000 a month for Wega V versus what they may have to spend in the future? Yeah, that's a very interesting topic. And uh, you can say it's, uh, I would say it's all about the efficacy of the medicine you develop. And uh, it, it goes several years back uh, where we launched the first uh, obesity medicine, which had a more modest uh, weight loss than what we bring today. Uh, now we have something that's uh, more meaningful in terms of weight loss. And uh, when you talk to payers, many of them have uh, population data where they can look that those living with a high BMI uh, being obese are typically also those who consume significant healthcare costs. You mentioned yourself uh, that it's a leading cause of a number of cancers, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. We just uh, released the headline data of a cardiovascular outcomes trial where we show that we reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by, by 20%. So these are very meaningful health benefits. And add, that, add to that, of course, what it also meets, means for the individual. Uh, living with obesity, um, sometimes meaning that you are less active in society, uh, perhaps less active in the workforce. And uh, governments also look at this as a trend that is uh, potentially reducing the number of active people in the workforce. And with aging populations, it's actually very meaningful to revert those trends and uh, have more uh, people can be active in the workforce and become taxpayers instead of uh, consumers of healthcare services. We also see a number of countries where we launch out of pocket that actually the individual citizen is willing to pay for the benefit it brings because if you have lived with obesity for a good part of your life, you have been struggling uh, and not succeeded uh, in, in your efforts. And uh, you have typically been paying for different types of, uh, of programs to help you lose weight and have typically not succeeded. So there's actually willingness also by the individual patient to, uh, to pay for, for care if it's uh, efficacious and, and safe, like what we see now. Yeah. And so, I mean, you, we've talked about this before, and I think you've expressed um, sort of view that the diet and exercise alone don't work as a, as a way of tackling obesity. Um, but I suppose I'm wondering what you think of the idea of 
merely giving an individual a thousand dollars and saying a month and saying, you go out, join a gym, join a weight loss program. Like, what do you think would be, I mean, would that not be a more long-term solution than I suppose a sort of medical intervention? I'm kind of curious what you think about that. Well, I believe that a lot of those who struggle with weight have uh, tried that. And, and I think that's some of the stigma that's uh, associated with living with obesity, that you go to your physician and you're seen as one that is not really physically active, one that cannot control your, your eating uh, patterns, etc. And you should just go home and, uh, and behave uh, the right way. But I think this is a, this is a completely unfair uh, stigma because different people are uh, you know, facing weight challenges in different ways. And uh, if you have uh, developed uh, uh, you know, obesity, you have a high BMI, you are not uh, able to go exercise the same way as uh, maybe you and I. So it's important to understand that this is a complex disease. Uh, it's not just about uh, what you eat and how you exercise. There's a genetic uh, component that, uh, that plays into people developing uh, body weight uh, and weight uh, obesity in different ways, but there's also a socioeconomic uh, dimension to it. And uh, I think it's important that we, we look at obesity in a more comprehensive way. And typically, uh, diet and exercise comes together with also the medical treatment. And that, that point you're making about the socioeconomic issues, I mean, as, as you mentioned, there are people who are, who are willing to pay out themselves to, to get on this drug. Do you do you foresee a time where you will be able to reduce the price of this this drug to a level that would be much more affordable for for customers that maybe are on the lower end of that that socioeconomic divide? Yes, it's a it's a great question. Uh, typically, when you have less fortunate people, they have to rely on established healthcare systems to get care. So those who pay our park today are typically uh, people who are who are better off. Um, who can make a choice whether they they pay out of pocket or, or what they, they decide to do with the with the financial means. But when it comes to the less fortunate people, uh, most likely a lower price point would not really uh, cater for them uh, either. So they would have to rely on, on the healthcare systems that's uh, active in different countries. So our aim is to try to make uh, deals with healthcare systems, and of course, it's a bit different from country to country in Europe, where it's typically uh, government funded healthcare, uh, we would aim to to uh, seek reimbursement for, for, for those patients uh, who have the highest BMI, have comorbidities, and perhaps also less fortunate from a socioeconomic uh, point of view, because we believe that there'll probably be no country that will be able to uh, fund for obesity care for everybody living with obesity because if you have in some countries around half of the population living with obesity it's not likely that you'll have government funded health care for half of the population but if we can work with uh, healthcare systems and really make sure that the less fortunate people and those with the highest bmi uh, the established comorbidities etc who will benefit the most from the care they actually get access I think there will be a huge benefit for the individual, be a huge benefit for the healthcare system, which will save money from the uh, hopefully less follow-on uh, diseases. Uh, and then there'll be a, a population of, of, uh, of patients who will have to pay out of pocket because uh, they have to take care of, of themselves, so to say. So that's, that's a bit the way we'll secure that uh, the social inequality is, uh, is addressed and, and, and everybody will have a, 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 the ability to get access to uh, weight loss medicines. Okay, so you're, you, you obviously have launched recently in Germany too, right? So is that sort of, how is that going, I suppose, just to start off? Yeah, so this is uh, one of uh, the trials we're making uh, where we're trying to launch, launch in a country that's uh, creating a, an obesity program. So it's a government designed obesity program to qualify to be in that program, you need to have launched your, your product. So the German one, the German launch is not a, a launch where we're trying to get to each and every person with obesity, but it's one where we're trying to get in and work with the healthcare system and uh, be part of this obesity program 
to really show what I just spoke about, that uh, by doing that, we can actually get to the patients who need the medicine the most and uh, try to solve a real healthcare challenge together with the government. So when we launched initially in the US, we saw a very, very strong uptake. We then tried to launch in Denmark and Norway, uh, which are much smaller markets, but we saw again, a very, very steep uptake. Now we're trying to launch into a larger market where we try to get into the healthcare system. Uh, so you can see this as as an attempt to, to test out different commercial strategies because we can see that the demand for the medicine is so strong that we actually have to uh, be more intentional in how we actually get to 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 the patients we uh, we would like to get to and how we collaborate with the healthcare systems, which is different in different uh, countries. But this is something that we we hear from doctors a lot that they think that the priority should be on the people with the highest BMI, as you say, the highest the highest risk. But uh, it, cost definitely comes into that. How? How can you do that? How can you specifically get to those people if they are, if they're not able to afford it, and and the government isn't isn't willing in some places to do that? But that's uh, that's what we're working on now, uh, and I actually believe that when you when you get to to the patients you describe those in most need, the highest BMI with established comorbidities, there is actually a very very robust, uh, say, return on on that investment. And you can say that return just become even stronger because we now have the cardiovascular safety um, and even not, not just safety, but actually reducing cardiovascular risk by 20%. And uh, it's uh, an obesity medicine, but actually reducing cardiovascular risk by 20% is stacking up among the best cardiovascular uh, drugs uh, that's uh, out there. And when we unfold the whole select uh, trial, all the different endpoints, I think people will see that that's actually a very, very strong case for both the healthcare system and the individual in treating obesity. This is not just about weight, it's actually about health and significantly improving health outcomes for these people. And uh, when you look at who are the patients consuming healthcare costs, uh, you'll see that people struggling with obesity are among those who consume the, the highest cost in the healthcare systems. And by addressing that, we actually take the burden off the healthcare system. And if you also add that in most countries, we see aging populations, we see challenges in actually recruiting people into healthcare systems, uh, nurses, doctors, etc. So unless we break that trend, most countries will be set up to uh, actually uh, having healthcare systems breaking down because there'll be more and more uh, customers to take care of and less and less uh, employees in the healthcare system to deal with that. So I believe dealing with obesity can be a, a, a very meaningful and uh, and a sizable part in actually reverting the trend and the burden on the healthcare system. And I do think we can articulate that and also uh, get uh, payers to uh, to buy into that. So that that uh, that that trial that you did, the select data that you're talking about. How did that change the course of the conversations you were having with governments once once you were able to see or show the cardiovascular benefits? What are the conversations like now? Have they shifted in the way that our gov governments are more open now to the idea of investing? Because prevention, I guess, is is really what obesity drugs are in, in many ways, is preventing something that happens down the road. And and governments and healthcare systems have not been very good on on on, on investing in prevention. Yeah, it's, it's still early days, I have to say, uh, but it didn't take long before we actually started having regulators, physicians reaching out to us to understand more what those data uh, in, entailed. And uh, obviously we are constrained on, on volumes uh, now. Um, so it's not that we uh, are uh, you know, in, a, in a massive launch uh, mode, we will be launching in more and more countries. So. So I think it gives us the opportunity in, in the continued journey of making launches into countries where we, we team up with healthcare systems and really get to, to the patients uh, in, in, the, in the biggest need. Um, and I'm, I'm actually very encouraged about our ability to do that. And I think there is a, I think there is a very meaningful price point. Uh, but typically payers and, and governments would be worried about us trying to uh, say, get to say half of a population in a, in a country when we launch. So actually coming in a proactive manner and trying to 
constrain some of these launches and finding ways, which is different from country to country, to make sure that we, we target our launches, I think works for the healthcare systems. And it also works for us because it means that we are establishing obesity as a real disease, a health concern with serious health benefits when we address those patients. And that of, will, of course, then generate uh, savings in the system. So over time, you can gradually expand to, to more and more patients uh, as we also ramp up manufacturing. So I have said uh, years back that I think this is going to be the medical intervention with the largest return to society. Uh, and I still believe that. And the select data, uh, I would say the very strong select data, uh, underlines that uh, value proposition. Um, Lars, I'm going to switch to the audience now. So we've got a question that's just come in, and it's a, quite a specific. But I think that the the I suppose the um, the context behind it is people are, I guess are wondering how long they need to be on the drug for to see a real benefit. So the question is, how often and how long must the medication be given to achieve a BMI of 25 from a BMI of 36? Now, obviously, as I said, that's very specific, but I suppose the 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 uh, reduction in BMI that you can you can see. So how long does somebody need to be on the medication to bring it down to a level that is, you know, a, a healthier level? Yeah. So it's it's a great uh, question. Um, we have studied um, our obesity medicine semaglutide uh, in this two point four milligram version uh, in in two year studies where we saw. Uh, a continued and sustained weight loss. We uh, we have not had patients on medicine for for many years yet, uh, but we believe that we can keep uh, weight loss uh, down, which is in itself a remarkable achievement because most interventions in 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 weight makes you lose weight, but you after some time regain weight. So so we have seen a, a sustained weight loss uh, over the two years. We also see obesity as a chronic disease, uh, which means that you have to keep taking your medicine. And in the trial, we also uh, let some patients, uh, st you know, let them stop treatment, and we saw that they rebounded uh, weight. One can speculate that over years, uh, if you have uh, managed to keep your weight uh, down, if you have changed uh, your your cravings, uh, etc., can you? teach the body, so, so to say, to have a different uh, disposition for, for, for your eating behaviors, et cetera. We don't know. When I ask uh, my own scientists, they say it's a chronic disease. It takes chronic treatment. Perhaps there will be a day where after years of treatment, you can, uh, you can uh, keep weight down with less efficacious treatment. Perhaps you have changed your lifestyle. Maybe perhaps you, uh, you are more active. So uh, I think time will show uh, what what that will be. In. But for now, uh, it takes, uh, say, a year's treatment to lose the weight. And we have data that uh, indicates that you keep that weight down for uh, at least the, the two years as we have studied. And we'll be collecting real-world evidence uh, to, to study this uh, for the longer term. I think that that idea of like the chronic disease, I think, is, is really interesting to kind of to classify obesity in that way. Because... I've I've read a few studies of people that say that they don't like the idea of taking a drug like Wake of V for the long term. But you're kind of essentially saying that you need to take it in order to keep your weight down. How do you imagine or like what work are you doing, I guess, to overcome that that mindset of your customers, which is essentially they think that by bringing their weight down to a certain level that they can come off it and sort of live, live a normal life then? Yeah. I think it's linked to the stigma around obesity, uh, where many of us who have uh, not lived with obesity, we see it as a lifestyle uh, thing, and you just, quote unquote, change behavior, and it's taken care of. But if you ask a person that has lived with obesity for a good part of her or his life, you will learn that they have tried all kinds of things, and the body fight back. And uh, in the beginning of the, uh, our conversation, I spoke a bit about how we actually designed for different lifestyle. So we designed to store fat, so to say. Uh, in ancient, ancient time, um, unless you could store fat until you had uh, the financial means or you could hunt to get the next meal, 
uh, you would not survive. So those who have survived over generations are those who can actually uh, store energy, store fat, uh, because you you burn that off uh, in in less good times. So when when we stop eating the body and and you start you know losing weight, your body will see that as a, as a health issue, and it will respond by actually slowing down uh, energy consumption. So you burn less calories. So just it just to explain that this is a, this is actually a disease, uh, and those who are genetically disposed to store more fat than others, they would perhaps have survived better in ancient times. Uh, but of course, nowadays where it's uh, it's easier to get uh, access to to calories, and uh, if you have the, those desires for food, the cravings, you end up. Uh, having to have medical intervention. And uh, I've had conversations with some of those who participate in the clinical trial, where they tell me about that for the first time, they actually feel that they get control of their life back. They're no longer obsessed by snacking the next meal. They feel they can leave their home. They can leave the, the refrigerator. They can go out and be, be socially active. And they also tell me what it meant when they then had to leave the clinical trial because it was over and the product was not yet launched and how they felt that the cravings came back. And, you know, there was this thing starting to control their life again. And uh, I think that that explains a bit what is at play for the individual patient. And I think we have to understand that this is actually not something that's self-inflicted. This is something that the, the body is imposing on them. And uh, that leads to uh, becoming obese, potentially developing diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, and then you're into chronic treatment of those comorbidities. Now we're talking about that you can start chronic treatment earlier on and actually prevent comorbidities. Uh, and I think that's very, very meaningful, obviously for the individual, but also for the healthcare system. So with the advent of efficacious medicine also comes the opportunity of actually understanding a disease. That's typically what happens until there's efficacious medicine for a, a, a disease without treatment. That disease is not fully understood. So I think these years we're starting to understand what is obesity. Uh, and increasingly people understand that it's just not about lifestyle. It's, 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 uh, there's a lot of stigma that has blurred our view of that as a disease. And uh, when we unfold the complete select uh, data set, I think there'll be a lot of interesting indications about what does it actually uh, mean in terms of real health outcomes when we treat uh, such a disease. Okay. Um, and Lars, I'm going to take just a, a couple of more questions again from the audience. Um, one is about your opinion on a sugar tax. So again, this would be an idea of sort of a government, I would imagine, intervention into stopping selling you know candies and and different types of food i suppose that that lead more to obesity what are your thoughts on that for me it's uh, it's meaningful to uh, make sure that there are not uh, soft drinks uh, candy etc in schools uh, for me it's also meaningful to try to uh, change behavior and consumption behavior and uh, and i think Taxes uh, could be something to consider. It's probably different from country to country how how it works. Uh, I live in a country where there's a tax on on sugar, um, and uh, it's my impression that it has led to to less consumption. But I also know in in certain countries you have uh, you have soft drinks available in in schools, uh, and uh, I think we have to we have to deal with that uh, because if you if you grow up being uh, customized to, to, to more sweet uh, food and, and drinks, you also generate, uh, uh, say, a preference for that. Um, and that can, be that can be difficult to revert uh, later on in life. So uh, different interventions to, to make sure that we develop the right habits and, and the right uh, preferences from a taste point of view, I think is, is part of the solution. Okay. Um, I wanted to move on to supply and demand, um, which again is you're sort of in an enviable position as some a company that literally cannot keep up with demand. You cannot supply enough of this drug. 
um, which is which is fascinating, I, I think, in it itself. And that is a big focus, I think, of your results often. That is the question that seems to be on the mind of many people is how can you expand capacity more? How can you manufacture it more? Uh, I mean, earlier this year, you, you said you'd be able to expand those starter doses. You, you'd be able to do that by September. You've kind of delayed that to, to 2024. I'm just sort of curious, Lars, what, what are the issues that you are, what are the sort of um, breaking it all down? What are the issues that you're facing when it comes to supply? What is the big problem? I would say that this is a very unusual uh, situation to be in for a pharmaceutical company because typically when you launch medicines, you have a, a relative well-defined population that you're going to, to serve. Um, you can schedule how you address that. Um, in the case of obesity, we're dealing with perhaps a billion uh, patients around the world. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any medicine today that's that's going to a, a billion. Um, some of the countries we talk about, uh, you have perhaps half of the population being uh, uh, in principle uh, patients and, and customers. We saw that the prior generations of obesity medicines had very modest uptake. Um, and that somehow also informed how we look at, at uptake. We saw that physicians were not that comfortable in using anti-obesity medicine. We saw that patients did not always seek care and uh, payers were not willing to, to pay for it. Um, then we launched our latest uh, innovation. We saw that physicians had actually piled patients up. Patients were really mobilized. And we also saw that payers were willing to pay. So we saw a dramatic shift in the demand curves we had uh, experienced in the past. We are ramping up manufacturing. We are adding lines uh, more or less uh, on an ongoing basis. And we'll, be keep, we'll keep doing that uh, for the coming years. But it's not unlikely that we'll actually be in a situation where as, as, as people become aware of this uh, opportunity, uh, the number of people who have been struggling with weight, uh, they, they become mobilized. As physicians understand that the stigma around looking at people with obesity is perhaps not fair. There's actually a medical condition here. There's actually significant health benefit in dealing with obesity. Uh, as payers see the value in that, that demand will keep uh, growing. Uh, so I think for a foreseeable future, we'll have a situation where demand will be larger than, than what we can, can supply. And obviously that leads to some dilemmas because when we uh, start patients on treatment, we would like them to continue. And that's why we in the US decided to actually limit the starter doses. So we're not, we are not after the, you know, the, the one extra dollar short term, but we are actually after that patients can start treatment and then they can trust that they can continue treatment and, and ramp up to say the maintenance doses. So we would actually rather have lower sales short term to make sure that patients and physicians get a positive experience uh, on, on the medicine. So we first said that we would restrict the starter doses until September. That was linked to uh, a drug shortage not notification uh, with the, the FDA. Uh, now we have said that we'll actually continue restricting that because we can see the underlying demand in the market is stronger than what we can produce. And I think that's a very, very a positive situation for, for the company, but I don't want patients to, to have a negative experience if we can avoid it. And that's why we, we, we have all doses available in the market, but we have less of the starter doses to make sure that those who, who move up to higher doses as a tight trade up, they uh, are able to get that. Yes, yeah, so we should sorry explain that uh, to the audience a little bit. Is that you, you start off on a low dose, right, of the yeah. drug, and then you move on to the larger dose. So the the idea is you you restrict people at the very beginning, so that because obviously you don't have the next level for them to to go on to. Yeah, I mean, what do you think, Lars, will be different though in twenty twenty four? What what are you getting? What kind of ducks are you getting in a row at the moment? Is that sort of your in house manufacturing that you're you're beefing up? Are you signing contracts with external contractors that will allow you then, I guess, to, to serve more people at that at that starter level? Yeah, it's, it's all of those elements. Uh, so we, uh, we started the year with one 
uh, external contract manufacturing line will start next year, uh, perhaps with, with, with three of those lines. Uh, we're also investing, uh, say, three and a half billion dollars uh, in, in capacity ramp up uh, inside the company, and we'll keep doing that in the coming years. So if you just look at it, there'll be a significant step up in, in capacity. Uh, so if you look at our our products, uh, our GLP-1 products, they are growing uh, in, in volume produced between, say, 70 and 200% uh, the first six months of this year. So, so when you talk about drug shortage not notifications in different countries, people might get the impression that we are not producing. We are producing a lot and a lot more each and every day. So there's a massive ramp up. Uh, all our sites are running 24-7. Uh, we have new lines coming in. So it's, it's a very dramatic ramp up. And, and I think it will probably be hard to find any other examples uh, in the, say, drug history of, of anything that has been rammed as much. And I actually brought one of the devices here. Um, so if you think about that, you have to do a sterile liquid filling of a, of a cartridge that goes into a device. Uh, you need to do that in sterile uh, environments. You have to uh, put it into a device like this. So this is highly complex manufacturing. And we produce these in, you know, the, the glass here, the filled glass is, uh, say, hundreds of, of millions, if not a billion uh, units a year, and, and that is growing. So we, we, are, we are growing significantly on a very large uh, base. And that's actually, uh, from as an industrial uh, point of view, uh, a very, very significant endeavor and uh, something that's not easy to copy, actually. Uh, so okay. when you ask others to, to help manufacture for us, very few companies can produce in, in you know, complex products, products in that scale um, that, that we are doing. So we're producing a lot of extra products, a lot of extra boxes each and every day. And that will also uh, fuel the growth in the coming years for Nord Nords. And you're obviously reliant as well on, on other companies to help you with this. And, and I think Catalan in, in the US has had some issues. I mean, how confident are you that they can resolve those and, and really you know, ramp up the capacity that you need? I'm, uh, I'm confident in that. Um, as I mentioned, these are not uh, easy uh, products uh, to produce. Uh, we have spent many years in becoming uh, good at it. Uh, now we're leveraging uh, contract manufacturers also. So there is a, there is a learning uh, scale, there's a ramp scale. Um, but just the fact that we, we keep uh, supplying higher and higher volumes uh, indicates that we are ramping. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about what that can bring of extra boxes uh, for these patients who are in need. Um, and again, I think it's it's a it's a positive because uh, the demand is so strong, so it creates that opportunity for us to keep uh, expanding our capacity and and reach more and more patients. Just the first six months this year, we uh, we reached four million more patients compared to a year ago. Uh, so I'm very encouraged by what we actually bring to patients, but also our ability to produce more and more. And over time, get closer and closer to that, uh, satisfying that demand. But it'll take it'll try to take quite some years before we can satisfy the whole market, because there are a lot of a lot of people out there who would uh, like to be on on this treatment. Um, and uh, I'm very encouraged about that. So this is it is crucial, isn't it, for the company because you are the first mover. You you really have the sort of obesity market to yourself now. Eli Lilly has its own drug that it's it's hoping to get approved as well. And there are others that are moving into the space. So your ability, I suppose, to serve as many customers as you possibly can is important at this point, isn't it? It 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 is always important uh, when you have developed the medicine to get to get to the patients. But I, I have I have never come across a commercial opportunity as as large as this. Um, it's if you combine the fact that it's uh, perhaps a billion people. The fact that it's uh, it's a it's a market that's being developed, um, there is ample opportunity for more competitors to serve that market. 
And when you have competition, you also become stronger. And uh, I think we have been competing for 100 years uh, in diabetes with uh, different companies. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive about our ability to, uh, to compete in that environment. We have a leading uh, product now. We have uh, a next generation product on the way. Uh, we have uh, early innovation, uh, both uh, in early phases and also preclinical phases to, to address this. Um, so I think this is going to be a, a great venture where we get better and better medicines uh, out for the patients. We establish uh, obesity as not just a, a, a treatment of, of, of weight issues, but also some of the comorbidities. And I think we'll see like in diabetes where it start out by just addressing glucose level, increasingly also addressing cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, et cetera. And I think we can do the same in, uh, in obesity, uh, prove that there are additional benefits and get more and more uh, benefits on, on label or have different products bringing different benefit, benefits because people living with obesity end up uh, struggling with a number of, uh, of follow-on diseases. So for me, this is just the beginning of a, a huge, uh, say, commercial opportunity, but also a very significant uh, intervention in actually dealing with some of the largest healthcare issues uh, of our time. And that will help hundreds of millions of people, but also take burden of healthcare systems that are struggling today. So I think we have the key to uh, a lot of, uh, lot of issues, and I'm hugely excited about that. Very good. Um, a question that is quite popular, um, we've got a question from the audience, and I've heard this from many people, that there, you, you clearly have a plenty of demand from the adult population, but obesity is obviously um, an issue that affects children as well. And what are your thoughts on, on treating children, uh, children that are struggling with obesity with, with Wego-V or, or any of your other drugs? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, topic. And um, I think there's an interesting opportunity to consider in, in, the, in the case of children, because uh, perhaps by uh, changing the trajectory of a child, you could prevent the chronic nature of obesity. Uh, if, if you are middle-aged and you have been struggling with obesity for, for many years, uh, the likelihood of actually uh, getting a cure is, is not that high. But there is perhaps an opportunity if we do medical intervention early enough with children that you can actually change a bit what is that, uh, say, the body's set point in terms of what will normal weight be for you later on. We know as you go through puberty, many uh, change, uh, you know, body shape and, and form. Uh, and uh, so, so I think it's an, it's an opportunity to actually put an individual on a much healthier track uh, for the rest of the life, if you figure out how to do in the, that in the best possible way. And we, we spoke about um, the you know access to sugar etc. So so I think in 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 childhood it is also really important. What are your what are the preferences you you develop for food? What is uh, your exposure to uh, to being physically active? Um, and I think there's also a medical component. So I, th I think it's a it's a it's a topic that we should really spend uh, a lot of uh, work on because if you can avoid a person from being obese uh, for the rest of your life, uh, there's a huge benefit for the individual and society in doing that. Yeah. And, and Lars, you mentioned, obviously, that, you know, your, people have not been on your drug for that long, as in, you know, the I suppose the side effects as well are, are yet to, to come about if there are many. But one one side effect that I think people are very interested in slash concerned is is the suicidal thoughts. Uh, and the suicides as well that were associated with the drug. I'm just sort of curious, Lars, what sort of monitoring are you doing at Nova Nordisk when it comes to, to suicide and suicidal thoughts? Are you, are you warning doctors when they're prescribing it that, you know, to, be, to be very careful? Or do you have a team that is involved in that at Novo that is, that is looking at that? Yeah. So, uh, 
safety is of course really really important for a company like like no nordisk and uh, when you develop medicines you obviously expose your your drug to a, a number of, of patients but also after you have launched the medicine you are obliged to follow all the safety uh, reporting and actually study each one of them and we have had this class of medicine on the market for 15 years so the tlp1 class so we have we have collected a lot of data and uh, we share those with the authorities uh, who also collect data from other companies who have similar medicines and and from from what we can see uh, there is no increased uh, risk uh, we just did the select data uh, the sex study, which is now also part of the evidence. And uh, we do not think that there is, a, say, a correlation between using these medicines and an increased uh, risk of suicidal uh, uh, or any of the other safety concerns that has been uh, described. So, so we take safety really, really important and we study the data. Um, but of course, when you have medicines that are being used in, in millions of, of, of patients, uh, you, and, and you also have medicine used in, in many different types of, of patients, then you come across uh, different events uh, for different people. And sometimes that can be linked or, or thought to be linked to a medicine. And that's why it's important that we collect these and, and we study uh, what happened. Uh, but so far, the totality of the data we have uh, is not something that creates uh, a concern for us. Okay. Um, the time has marched on very quickly, Lars. So I think I probably have time for one more question. Um, I'm curious, You, as we mentioned, the, the size of your company, which gives you exposure to lots of different types of investors now. And, and I'm just sort of curious, before when you were mainly a diabetes company you were mainly treating diabetes there was still quite a lot of scrutiny on your company particularly around price of insulin and all of that how do you think you're going to cope with i would imagine even more scrutiny when it comes to the pricing of obesity of obesity drugs excuse me yeah it's 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 true that uh, for for us uh, there's scrutiny on, on pricing i think that actually goes for the for the for our industry um so for me it's all about the clinical data we uh, we 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 create, uh, how we articulate the value of the medicine, and when you deal with uh, serious chronic diseases, I think you have a, a unique opportunity in actually expressing what is the value of uh, of what we do, because increasingly people develop uh, these chronic uh, diseases, the whole cardiometabolic uh, syndrome, so to say. And with aging populations, early and earlier onset uh, of these diseases, uh, it actually becomes increasingly meaningful to do medical intervention because you get a return on that. So um, I, I welcome that we have these discussions and we actually articulate what's the value uh, of, of treating these diseases. And then in many cases, it's, uh, it's also a political discussion in how do you fund medicine and, and maybe how do you also reward a company like Novo Nordisk and we would be willing to enter into say creative deals where we we are rewarded as the value of our medicines uh, are displayed in large populations so there can be different ways of trans transacting in the future um, but I think the starting point is that we believe we have highly efficacious medicines that are dealing with some of the large societal challenges and we are we're open for exploring ways where you can share the cost burden uh, with also seeing the benefits. Many healthcare systems have yearly budgets and can struggle with paying upfront for something that, that's bringing a value uh, you know, in, a, in a couple of years. Uh, but it does mean you shouldn't be spending the, the, the upfront money or you should be using medicine. Uh, and, and we can find different ways of doing it. But we're very comfortable in, in the value of the products we bring and also the price point we have. Okay. Well, thank you, Lars. Um, that's all the time we have for this newsmaker. Uh, but it has been fascinating 45 minutes for me. Uh, and I really appreciate your time. It was a very quick 45 minutes. So thank you for the opportunity.